The following is a program of the Santa Barbara County Education Office. To learn more, visit sbceo.org. I'm Susan Salcido, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools, and I'm so delighted to introduce our guest today, Jean Gradias, who's a teacher on special assignment from Cold Spring Elementary School. Jean, congratulations on your recognition uh, for the Venico Crystal Apple Educator of the Year for last year, for this year. Thank you. Yes, and thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Yeah, really appreciate it. And, I'm really excited to share with our audience today all about what you do at Cold Spring and your recognition too. But um, before we dive into the teaching and the learning and the instruction and the students, let's talk about you, about okay. where you were born and raised in your childhood. Okay, I was born in Hawaii and um, we moved to California um, when I was about five or six years old and I did most of my early elementary education and then through high school in Marin County um, which was great it's beautiful it's a lot like Santa Barbara so there's a lot of um, natural beauty you have a lot of hiking and biking and it was a really great fit so um, really enjoyed coming down to Santa Barbara for college mm -hmm. and felt like I was at home. So I need to go back and just ask you, where in Hawaii were you born? I was born in Oahu. Oahu, okay, so you came over when you were five. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did, I did. That's great. And then, again, moving down from Marin to Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. sounds like you moved here to go to UC Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And what was your major, and what did you do while you were here at UCSB? Um, I was an English major, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, it was a really neat experience to be able to um, enjoy and and learn in an environment where I felt so fed. Um, I had really incredible professors at UCSB and a lot of people that challenged me and encouraged me to think and consider different career paths and um, I ended up volunteering in um, a local school at Kellogg Elementary School and realized when I was volunteering there that this is a lot of fun <laughs> and I just absolutely loved it. So so the volunteering experience led you to teaching. It did. So did you stay at UCSB for your graduate studies? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I think that probably similar to a lot of people when you graduate from UCSB it's really hard to leave Santa Barbara so when I was looking into credentialing programs it felt pretty natural to stay here. So as soon as you graduated from UC Santa Barbara with your credential um, and your master's degree, did you go right into teaching at that time? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. I, I graduated and I think I finished my master's in July and was teaching in August. Um, but I moved up to Portland, Oregon, and I started teaching in a little school in Lake Oswego. I see, okay. Yeah. And what, what drew you to Portland, Oregon? Well, so the whole love of the outdoors, um, one of the things that I am pretty passionate about and have enjoyed ever since I was a little kid is fly fishing. Mm -hmm. So I was really itching to move somewhere where there would be a river nearby where I could get off work and fish for a couple hours and then come home and do it again the next day. And there weren't a lot of places where you could still be in an urban setting and be in a city and have that experience, but Portland is one of them. That's really fascinating. I'm yeah. sure it was a really great way to, to balance out a day or a week by oh, going out so into the river. Who taught you or how did you learn how, oh, to, how to fly fish? Yeah, that would be my dad. Uh -huh. My dad was an avid fly fisherman and he taught me when I was about six. Mm -hmm. So we would spend every summer um, up in the mountains fly fishing and it stuck. And I think I was probably the only kid in my dorm who brought their fly rods and would head on up to Paradise Road and go fishing. Um, 
you know, after class. I love it. Yeah. I bet there's a lot of metaphors in fly fishing that it's to so life true. and teaching. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, it's so true. <laughs> I would imagine anything that you can think of oh, now in it's terms just of just not about the fish. Ah. I would say. <laughs> it's nothing to do with the catching. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So then you found your way from Oregon then to back mm -hmm. to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. So was that your uh, that was the last stop, um, Oregon to Santa Barbara? You know, or? it was interesting. So my husband um, and I, he he actually was relocated back to Santa Barbara for work. And, um, and so I felt like that was not a compromise. And it made a lot of sense. We, we loved being here. And he's from here. So um, okay, great. And so how did you find yourself at Cold Spring Elementary? Well, I feel really fortunate. I was I was here. I worked for a year as a youth services specialist through CADA, mm -hmm. um, and I was on the campus of Carp Middle School. And it was a really, really wonderful experience and and challenging in so many ways. And I found myself terribly missing elementary school and having my own classroom. So I was able to um, connect with different principals, and I just happened to send an email out to Cold Springs principal at the time, which is Brian McCabe, and he responded with an email right away that said, we just had a teacher who was going on leave. You should put in an application. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of where it started. And that's where you've been. And I haven't left. <laughs> and you haven't yeah. left. <laughs> and you, I introduced you to our audience today as a teacher on special assignment. Mm -hmm. That isn't what you started out as no. at Cold Spring. So what did you start as, as out as? and then tell us what your assignment means now. Sure. Um, I began as a sixth grade teacher and um, it's kind of the best kept secret actually. I feel like <laughs> sixth grade is such a sweet spot of elementary school and um, I, I feel really connected I think just in general to sixth graders because they're just right on this emotional cusp of stepping out and um, it was a really neat experience. So I actually taught sixth grade for 14 years mm -hmm. at Cold Spring, and then the opportunity arose to um, consider a role as a teacher on special assignment as we were ushering in these new next generation science standards. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt like I was equipped to, to try that out and, and take it on, so that was sort of what led me into this Role. That's fantastic. That's really great that you bring such uh, rich experiences into your role now as a TOSA. Now for the viewers who might not know what a TOSA does different mm -hmm. from what a classroom teacher does, can you explain what a TOSA does at sure. your school? Um, yeah, I think it's different mm -hmm. for every school. So at our school, a TOSA, um, we, we really introduce the position initially with the Common Core Standards as we are trying to acknowledge that it's a pretty significant shift in not just here's a new set of content that you need to teach, but really there's a new strategy towards delivering information to kids and teaching kids. So recognizing that we needed to support teachers in this new way led our district to develop these positions. So initially began as a Common Core position um, and then as the Next Generation Science Standards uh, were introduced, um, it shifted towards a science focus. But really what it is, it's a lot of teacher coaching, mm -hmm. um, working one-on-one -on -one with teachers, uh, helping them to integrate different instructional strategies that may be um, a change from how they have delivered science in the past. Mm -hmm. So really working together to um, fine tune instruction in ways that meet our new standards. That's fantastic. So you yeah. still get to work with students. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yeah. And, and now you work with teachers in a different way mm -hmm. and really mentoring, coaching, working alongside. Mm -hmm. And we have some new standards, not only Common Core as you mentioned, but right now a next generation of science standards which are so exciting. Mm -hmm. You're a TOSA in especially in um, specializing in STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, mm -hmm. and you're bringing your uh, background, your experience, your fly fishing, your science background, your sixth grade experience into that. Tell us what that looks like in terms of bringing that experience and expertise um, into your TOSA yeah. world. Um, I think it's just so exciting because you have this opportunity in the STEAM position to be working with kids, kind of focusing on project-based learning models to help them to experience science and engage with scientific principles and practices, but at the same time, they're really learning these 21st century skills and um, 
a lot of what we focus on in the STEAM classroom, while it, it aligns really nicely with the science and the science content, a lot of what we focus on are really the practices. How do you set up an investigation? What does it mean to question something? Um, how do you communicate what you've discovered? And how do you connect this to something that's going on in the world around you? That's fantastic. I love it. So mm -hmm. innovative. You get to mm -hmm. wonder out loud, don't mm -hmm. you, and experiment. Right. Um, and something that we all experienced um, recently was a solar eclipse. Yes. The solar eclipse happened, I think, might have been the first day of school for was, Cold Spring. Yeah. So what, what happened at Cold Spring with the students, you and your, wearing your hat, as the steam tosa around the solar eclipse. You know, it was so special. And I think, like, you can't plan those things, but that was probably the best way to kick off a school year because nice. there was no, um, I can't think of a school year that had more energy and excitement and passion towards learning and understanding the natural world mm -hmm. than having a solar eclipse happen on the first day of school. Um, as a school, we decided that absolutely you can't have the kids miss this. Mm -hmm. So we, um, put together an assembly. I gave the kids a super quick overview about you know, what is even happening in an eclipse and what does that mean and what are we looking for and what does that mean for us. And then um, we had just a, a really generous parent, Gary Fuller, donated the glasses for the entire student body. Um, and so all of the kids were able to safely view the eclipse. We talked about proper viewing and then um, the assembly ended right at the peak eclipse time. So the kids received their glasses on the way out of the auditorium and immediately put them on and walked out and were just, you could hear the gasps and the awes and the kids were just so energized and um, it, was, it was fantastic. Like you couldn't have asked for a better way to to start a school year. Right, it sounds incredible. It really and was. Clouds parted and, yeah. you know, it was, is, yeah. it was like how it like, went from this cloud cover to all of a sudden this open opportunity for the kids to view what was happening. And That's so great. That's yeah, so it really great. was. We were talking a minute ago about the questioning, the wondering, mm -hmm. the, in, the inquisitive nature that comes with STEAM mm -hmm. subjects. And one of the things I imagine that comes with it that you, I'm sure, incorporate into your uh, teaching and learning are, are even um, uh, mistakes that occur, failure oh that happens as part of learning. Can you talk about yeah. that with our audience? Yeah, um, I think that that is such a mind shift for kids to be able to not just persevere through failure, but acknowledge that failure is actually a part of success, that to arrive at a successful end you have to have the information that comes from failure. And so um, trying to support kids in that journey and really um, embrace when something goes wrong, that that actually isn't wrong, that's just one step closer towards understanding what is right. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. love that. That's really so special that you can hone re right in on that and, and help your students understand mm -hmm. that that's part of success. Mm -hmm. I love that. So I understand that your kindergartners took a trip to see a local architect last oh, year. Gosh. So talk to us about that. Oh gosh, it was so sweet. Um, well, our local architect actually came into our classroom, ah, okay. which was really fun. And uh, the kids were, learning about interdependence and ecosystems and understanding the different roles that um, animals and plants play in a healthy ecosystem. And we kind of took on the challenge of looking in our backyard mm. and what do you do, um, how do you support a backyard ecosystem? And they really landed on this idea that you need strong pollinators and this good population of pollinators and that led to looking at birds and that led to supporting birds in our backyard which led to bird houses and you can kind of see where the architect comes in now. I love it. So we had this opportunity for the kids to really come to an understanding of the process of building and designing from the ground up. So. Um, Spoiler alert, it was my husband who's the local <laughs> architect. <laughs> Although I'm sure there are many who would have come in. Um, but he, he was able to come in and he talked to the kids about, you know, different perspectives and a plan view versus an elevation view. They practiced making um, different plans and building from plans with manipulatives and cubes. And eventually what that led to was them designing each their own unique birdhouse 
drawn up in a three-dimensional CAD program, and then they had this huge build day. So, and this is with kindergartners. Kindergartners. That's amazing. Yes. I, I love that. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I'm sure the local architect did a great job. He was pretty good. He was pretty he good. Was pretty good. good. <laughs> so another example of, of, of working on something at your school site, I understand there was some habitat design, something at your school. What was that about? Yeah, that was really neat too. Um, our second grader, so you know that for the first time in like 10 years it rained last year. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we had a section on our campus that at one point Point was lawn and then as the drought continued it really turned into a, not just unattractive patch of dead grass but really a, a bit of a nuisance because now with nothing growing year-round it was a lot of dirt and so what would happen is when you would get the rain or even the heavy mist kids would track mud into the classrooms and it was kind of a pain and so the second graders when we were doing just a we did a habitat walk on campus and they noticed it and they're like what is going to live here and we sort of acknowledged that really this is sort of a um, a space that failed because of the drought and that led them to answer the question well what do you want to do about it which a long you know a, a long path later they ended up installing a native garden so they were able to work with a local landscape architect um, Chris Gilliland and they were able to work with folks from Explore Ecology and learn about native plants they worked with professors from Westmont um, we had a, a biology professor come in and teach the kids about you know different native zones what belongs there what's going to thrive and um, the second graders presented in multiple venues. They came to the county and presented at the Showcase for Innovation. They presented to the board, and they were able to generate um, an online giving campaign, raise their funds. And now, when you walk on our campus, there's a beautiful native garden habitat where there once was a patch of mud. Wow, that's incredible. What, yeah. a, what an arc, what a story. It was that so starts cool. with inquiry around mm -hmm. their own environment mm -hmm. to say, what are we going to do about this? Mm -hmm. To all that engagement that you that you brought into to what they have today. That's incredible. And being in, in, in our community, there's so many different people to reach out to who want to help and support. Right. UCSB is one. You mentioned just mentioned Westmont. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a connection you have with UCSB and researchers who come in with students, too. You know, we had a really neat opportunity last year to work with folks from the Materials Research Lab, and they um, you know, our second graders were studying properties of matter and they were looking into building structures of, with different um, types of materials and they, we aimed for that authentic audience by having the materials research lab come in, give them feedback, listen to their presentations, and they worked with the kids on a few different um, lab experiments too, which was really special. So the UCSB students came in and mm -hmm. worked with your second grade students? Mm -hmm. They did. How do you think the UCSB students, uh, what were their reactions to working with the youngsters? Oh gosh, I think that it's always refreshing to <laughs> work with little kids, and I think also, um, you know, there's there's a, a neat sense of purpose that you're you're contributing to a broader base of knowledge with your own research and what you're doing as a graduate student, but you're also reinvesting in your own community, and that's pretty neat. So you work with students, um, but you also work with teachers as mm -hmm. a TOSA, and I'm sure you you know you you think about your own craft as a teacher by working with teachers. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about excellent teaching and learning through working with teachers? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest thing that I've learned is um, you have to yourself embody what you tell your kids, which is it's okay to take a risk as a teacher. It's okay to try something new. It's okay to deviate from um, what you've always done because that's how you're going to discover these experiences and and provide these opportunities for kids that are really authentic um, where that innovation starts to happen mm -hmm. and let's talk a little bit about technology mm. I mean T T for technology that's in there yeah, yeah. it's in there <laughs> and I know Cold Spring has adopted a lot of uh, great technology for students how do you see that working its way in that being technology mm -hmm. uh, its way in with uh, students in the classroom yeah it, it's becoming pretty seamless mm -hmm. which is really I think it's um, no longer novel to have technology in the classroom. It, it would be a mistake not to have technology in the classroom because so much of 
uh, what we are preparing kids for involves technology. So as our as our own world has shifted and our workforce has shifted, we have a, a generation of kids that has no choice but to be immersed mm -hmm. in technology. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the neat part is that we're really seeing now ways to use technology to enhance learning. It doesn't just become something that you are getting good at and practicing, but it actually changes the way that you understand a concept because you have access to different types of technology. Yeah, really does open up windows and doors. Yeah, yeah really. So now let's turn it to you for a moment. Okay. You specifically in terms of the recipient of a Crystal Apple mm. Award, which is a huge um, honor and recognition. There's yeah. only 10 given out in the county, two for educators, and you're one of them. Mm -hmm. So what did it feel like to, to receive that uh, award and what does that mean to you? You know, it, it was a surprise, um, and it was, it was quite humbling because there are so many incredible teachers in our town at my school, um, and I really felt like um, I was quite honored, but at the same time, I, I feel like I accepted that on behalf of all of the teachers at our school who were able to make contributions towards this new innovative program who were willing to take those steps and try new things with their classrooms mm -hmm. and that's sort of what allowed these bigger leaps to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't have a native garden if your second grade teacher isn't fully on board and pushing the kids to do investigations in the classroom. So there's a lot that I think was um, like a lot of that recognition goes out and not necessarily just towards me. Oh, well that's really nice and um, I would say I, I remember the resounding applause and ovation that you received from your teachers from Cold Spring when mm. you accepted the award so I think they, they feel it too. Thank you. Yeah. So being a teacher on special assignment, mm -hmm. what would you say is the best part of that? That's a good question too. Um, I, I think that it's uh, it's a it's an opportunity to use a different set of skills, and um, that is a, a really satisfying part of it. That I love kids and I love being in the classroom, but I also really enjoy being able to support and help my colleagues in that way. So I think being a resource mm -hmm. to um, to colleagues is probably the best part of it. And if we flip it, what might be not the worst part, but a challenging part of being yeah. a TOSA? Yeah. Um, you know, it is challenging. It's challenging because you are, you're asking a lot of other people to step away from things that are very comfortable and, um, you know, it's, you're, you're there with support and you're there with resources and at the same time you know that you're pushing someone to, to step into new territory and that, that that's hard, that's mm -hmm. scary. Mm -hmm. So It's a lot of trust building. It totally is. And yeah. something is new. Next generation science standards for many educators right now is mm -hmm. still relatively new. Mm -hmm. And so you're uh, building trust and uh, that collegiality is there obviously mm -hmm. with new content. Um, and for you, you're a lifelong learner. You're always learning and growing. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that you would attribute some of your learning towards? Was it a professional workshop? Was it some readings that you've done? Is there anything particular that you can can call out that maybe is recent that really in, impacted you yeah you know the most impactful just as far as the way that I structure and frame my own teaching now the most impactful experience I had recently was um, attending the Buck Institute project-based learning mm -hmm. workshop and I just really feel like it it brought so many pieces together for me and it really um, it really illustrated how you can address content, address 21st century skills, have incredibly compelling, engaging activities for kids that matter and are relevant. And it was, it was a really neat experience. And I think that that has changed and, and transformed a lot of how I approach a lesson and a lesson sequence. That's great. And did you go solo or did you go with colleagues? Was it a team? You know, I, I was able to go twice mm -hmm. now. Um, the first time I went was with another incredible third grade teacher um, who joined me and then made it um, pretty seamless as we were able to team teach and plan projects for third grade. And then this past year I went with um, first grade teacher. So kind That's of great. slowly getting the, the seeds planted mm -hmm. at our school. 
That's fantastic. So, Jean, teaching is an all-encompassing thing, and you're also yeah. a, a, a wonderful mother and wife, too. So you've yeah. got to find balance somewhere in a week or a day or a month. How do you find balance? Oh, man. Um, I, I think most of the time uh, balance comes with just kind of the, the small moments in a day, you know, the, the, the debrief time in the car on the ride home with the kids and the walk around the block and, you know, heading out to get ice cream after dinner. We don't have big chunks of our day that are super free to just relax and recreate, but I think that we make a lot of time as a family for each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and that seems to be a good way to recharge a bit. So those little moments are really meaningful and really impactful meaningful. for you. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful. And you know, you you are a, a seasoned teacher um, with, I'm sure, tons of advice for up and coming teachers. What's some advice you would give for somebody who's entering into our profession today? Mm. Yeah. I would tell somebody who is who's just at the beginning um, that don't be afraid to take a risk. Don't be afraid to try something new. You know, be bold in your teaching. Embrace the idea that failure isn't failure, even even as a teacher. That's great. And as we wind down the interview, Jean, I want to give you an opportunity to say a message to the students that are watching today, um, perhaps their parents, mm -hmm. and even, even the Cold Spring community or the larger community. What message do you want to share? You know, I, I think really just thank you. I'm, I'm so grateful for the Cold Spring community, for those students, for the way that um, they have been part of my family for, I mean, like this is, we're going on 17 years there. So I feel like I um, did a lot of personal growing up at that school also. And I'm just grateful for all of the members of that community. Jean, we are so grateful for, for you, um, what you contribute to the educational community. You're, you're incredible and such a leader, such a teacher, mm -hmm. um, somebody who really, I think, um, does in your life what you do in the classroom too, which is wonder and look about yeah. and really take each moment for what, what it has to offer. And we're so fortunate to have you in our classrooms and at, at Cold Spring as a TOSA. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank you very much. I'm Susan Salcedo, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools. Thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Talking with Teachers.